morning. I always like it when the kids outnumber the adults. I think we're pretty close to that. One, two, three, four, five. Jet, one, two, three, four, five here. Joel? Joel's not here? Okay. 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 So, we're good. One, two. Yeah. So, we still have people trickling in. Uh, after the pandemic, we, uh, we're just doing online services, and we're doing more online services now, uh, uh, in-person services as well as online, I mean. And so we have, we're still getting some people coming in. Um, so keep uh, praying, keep working on people that kind of took some time off, get them back here. But uh, anyway. I like to start off by saying the same thing every Sunday because this is something we as a church believe. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on your spiritual journey to Jesus, please know that you are most welcome here to receive God's goodness, his mercy, and his love. If some churches don't like messy people, they'll fit in here. We have, we have some real people, genuine people, people that have been through some... Tough times in their lives, but God is more than able to forgive and heal and make people whole. And we believe in that with all our hearts. The lectionary has readings, and I like to do one of the readings from the lectionary each week. I kind of skip around depending on which I think might feel best with the service for the day. Uh, They do readings out of Psalms, out of the Gospels out of the epistles, and one for today is out of 1 John. Now, we're going to be looking at Jesus, but I think this fits well because we've been called by God to love God and love each other, right? In 1 John 4, John writes, Dear friends, let's hate each other. Is that what God said? Let's love each other, right? God tells us, let's love each other because love is from God. And everyone who loves is born from God and knows God. The person who doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. This is how the love of God is revealed to us. God has sent his only son. You guys know who his only son is? Jesus. Good job, Matthew. Send his only son into the world so that we can live through him. This is love. It is not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the sacrifice that deals with our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us this way, how how did God love us? I just read God loved us so much he sent Jesus to die for our sins. Isn't that right, Mason? Jesus died for your sins. God loves us in the same way we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God remains in us and his love is made perfect in us. Then uh, verse 19, we love because God first loved us. Now here's a a big thing. I want everybody to to really pay attention, okay? On this one. Those... Those who say, I love God, but hate their brothers or sisters are liars. After all, those who don't love their brothers or sisters whom they have seen, they can hardly love God whom they have not seen. This commandment we have from him, those who claim to love God ought to love their brothers and sisters also. Who here loves God? Well, the Bible tells us that if you don't love others, if you hate other people, then you don't actually love God. If you love God, you will show it by loving others. Now, there's people that say they love God, but the moment someone says something that upsets them, they act like this. Throwing a fit. Somebody said something I don't like. 
You know anybody like that? Yeah. Yeah, even some adults act like that. Somebody posts something on Facebook they don't like. <clears throat> but God tells us that if we are born again Christians, if we gave our life to God, we will love each other. And so today we are very, very, very thankful that God loves us. So I'd like us to sing about God's love. It's going to be number 128 in the hymnimal. I like to pronounce the word hymnimal like I pronounce the word aluminum, but no. In the hymnal, number 128, he loves me. Let's, uh... all right, I can't skip any of these verses. They're all too good. And did my Savior bleed? And did my Sovereign die? Would He devote that sacred head for such a word as I? A lot of times people, uh, churches will skip a third verse, but I love that third verse. Well, might the sun in darkness hide? Anybody ever have a day where it feels like the sun is hiding? When Christ the mighty maker died for man, the creature sin. That's how we know he loves us. Even though it feels like the sun is hiding, Jesus Christ died for us and we can trust in him. If he loves us enough to die for us, he isn't going to leave us when the sun's hiding, when the times are hard. We're, we aren't on our own. Well, let's uh, take a moment to pray. I'd like everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. And if you have anything you want to bring to God today, just between you and God, say it to him. Like, uh, dear God, help me with school or help me at home, whatever it might be. Father, we bring these requests to you because you told us that you love us and you care about us. And everything that bothers us bothers your heart. Everything that weighs on us, you are willing to take away and take upon yourself. 
There is an old song that I love that says, What peace we often forfeit, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to you, God, in prayer. So often we, we carry all this weight, we carry uh, all this baggage, these worries, these anxieties, because we don't bring it to you in prayer, God. Help us, Lord, bring everything to you in prayer and lay it at your feet and give it to you. Believing, God, that you are more than able to deliver us. You are a big, big God who loves us, who is patient with us, who will never leave us, and you will never forsake us. So help us, God, cling to you. Be with us this morning in our church service today. I pray you'll anoint our time here. You'll speak to each of our hearts and help us to leave today a little more in love with you and in love with each other. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'd like, before we sing our next hymn, I'd like us to take a moment to uh, read in the hymnal, number 513. It's the Apostles' Creed. Now, this is a creed that goes clear back to the early church. Not long after uh, Jesus went to heaven and the church started in Acts, the church got together and they wrote this creed. It's a list of things that we as Christians believe in. So this is very important. There's people out there that teach lies, right? They teach bad things. And so we like to know what we believe. So this one is very important. So I'm gonna, we're going to read it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's sing number 221 in our hymnal. Number 221.
Thank you kids for helping with the singing and I'm gone. He loves grandma, but he loves Carrie. <laughs> What's that? That's something you learned. The kids love you, but they love Carrie more. <laughs> You'll come through it. <laughs> Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles and you'd like to follow along, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Luke, chapter 2 is often preached at Christmas time because of the beginning deals with Christmas, but um, we're going to go a bit beyond that part towards the end of Luke chapter 2. <clears throat> Last Sunday, I preached on a worldly counterfeit Jesus, if you remember that, if you were here for that or watched the video. Talked about how many in the world today and in churches have this false version of Jesus. Their version of Jesus likes their sinful behavior. And not only does he approve it, he likes it. Uh, their version of Jesus agrees with their opinions and beliefs. Uh, you'll run into that. People who are convinced that, well, you know, God agrees with me. And the question isn't whether God agrees with us. The question is, do we agree with God? One of my favorite stories about that is found in Joshua 5. The, uh, the people of God are reaching Jericho. And Joshua is out preparing his mind, his thoughts, his heart for battle. And he sees a man with a sword drawn. He goes up to the man and says, are you on our side or that of our enemies? The man says, neither. I'm the commander of the Lord's heavenly force, and now I have arrived. I love that because the answer, are you on my side or my enemy's side, Jesus? Neither. I'm the commander of the Lord of hosts. I'm the commander of God's armies. I am Jesus. You need to get on my side. Too often we're convinced that God is on our side when we should be more concerned with whether or not we're on God's side. Whether or not the kingdom of heaven is first. But that's a whole nother sermon and I'm not going to get into that today. Uh, I talked about last week about a snow white Jesus. Who I remember growing up with a snow white Disney snow white who, you know, singing in the birds and the, everything is happy, happy. And their version of Jesus, there's no wrath, no judgment. I'm okay, you're okay. Sin isn't a thing. Hell isn't a thing to them. If, if hell isn't real and sin isn't real, then Jesus didn't die for any, any reason then. Because there was nothing for him to rescue us from if hell isn't real and sin isn't real. Anyway, that was last Sunday. Now, I wanted to move on today to looking at the real Jesus, the Jesus in Scripture. And I believe that our view of Jesus is essential because he is our one supreme model. He stands before us as our faultless blueprint. 
In the Nazarene church, we talk about holiness a lot, don't we? Holiness unto the Lord is our watchword and our song. We believe in holiness, and God has called us to live a holy life. And often when we're describing holiness, we use the phrase Christ-likeness, right? We are holy when we are Christ-like, when we allow Jesus Christ to live through us, not by our own strength, not by our efforts, but by the Holy Spirit consuming us and empowering us to live out Jesus. See, it's not legalism where we try real hard. It's God living through us because we are fully surrendered, because we are fully consecrated, because we are completely open to God and his fire fell consumed every sinful thing and now we belong completely and fully to God sanctified entirely and God now lives through us a living sacrifice but. so we talk a lot about Christ likeness and so understanding who Jesus was what he said what he did in the gospels it's really important because if we have a false view of Jesus it's, it's going to mess up how we live. It's going to mess up how we live out Jesus Christ. Because if we have this false view of God, if we've gotten off base somewhere, then it's going to affect everything. Because Jesus is the center. Jesus is the core of our mission. He is the rock upon which we stand. He is the, the creator and sustainer of our faith and our church, our community as Christians. And so it is essential that we have a proper understanding of Jesus. And there's this group today in the church called, uh, they're going by progressive Christianity. That's the phrase nowadays. Uh, it's taken on different names since the beginning of the church. But uh, progressive Christianity where they, they teach where Jesus isn't that important, where the Bible isn't that true. And they, they water it down and wash it down and they take the importance of the blood away, the importance of Jesus away. And they have this weird, twisted view of Jesus. And so we need to be careful that, that we don't even start down that slippery slope. Yeah, sure, we, we might still believe Jesus is the Son of God, but we need to understand better who he is and what he said and what he did so that we don't even get close to false teaching. And so that's why I consider this message so important. So going off that, I wanted to take today to look at the first recorded words of Jesus. Anybody remember what their first words were? Or maybe their kids' first words or grandkids' first words? What? <laughs> Jesus' first words? <laughs> what was that? Oh, Joel's first word was wrist? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mama. Mama. I think mine might have been no. <laughs> I don't remember. I got a baby book at home. I should, should have looked at it before it came. I don't know. But we have here the first recorded words of Jesus in this passage. We don't get other views of Jesus. It's not until he's 12 that we have a story from his childhood. And then we don't really have any other stories until he steps out in ministry. So what makes this story so important? And I'm going to get into that in a minute here. Let's start in verse 41. Each year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to their custom. After the festival was over, they were returning home. But the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't know it, supposing that he was among their band of travelers. They journeyed on for a full day while looking for him among their family and friends. When they didn't find Jesus, they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple. He was sitting among the teachers, listening to them and putting questions to them. Everyone who heard him was amazed by his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were shocked. His mother said, child, anybody ever say that to their kids? Mm -hmm. Child, why have you treated us like this? Listen, your father and I have been worried. We've been looking for you. 
Jesus replied, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he said to them. Jesus went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. His mother cherished every word in her heart. Jesus matured in wisdom and years and in favor with God and with people. Father, I pray for your anointing upon your word and your anointing upon each of us. May we have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. We need your presence. We need your anointing. We need your, your Holy Spirit to speak to us so that we may be shaped and changed and empowered to live out Jesus to a world that doesn't love you. I ask the name of Jesus. Amen. First thing I'd like to point out is something that occurred to me while I was reading this, is that I really think that this was a prophetic glimpse of the resurrection. I think it's probably one of the big reasons why, why Luke included it, rather than all the other stories of Jesus' childhood, because it was a prophetic glimpse of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We see here in this passage that it was three days that Joseph and Mary searched before they found him. And it was during the Passover which was the same festival when Jesus was crucified, buried, and rose again. Luke pointed that out. Jesus asked them, why were you looking for me? The angel said at the tomb, why are you looking for the living among the dead? In Luke 24, 21, we have the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they're talking to Jesus, even though they don't recognize him, they don't realize it's Jesus yet. They, the disciples said, we had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago. So we see a similarity here between Mary and Joseph frantically searching for their child, Jesus, 12-year-old Jesus. And they're searching and they don't know where he's gone. Then we see in the burial and resurrection of Jesus, the disciples three days later, not sure what had happened to the body of Jesus. What happened? They're stressed, they're worried, they, their dreams, they'd followed this man for three years. And now he was gone, he was buried, but then his body disappeared and they don't understand, they don't know what's going on. Until they finally find Jesus, Mary and Joseph find him in the temple. They find Jesus, he, he showed up in that, a, a, a number of different ways to the disciples after his resurrection, the road to Emmaus, but also in a, a room that was locked. There was no way he could have entered. And what speaks to me about both stories being included in Luke is that we have such tunnel vision. You know what tunnel vision is? When you get so focused on one thing, you don't notice anything else. We as people, we get such tunnel vision. And we go to God saying, God, why? I don't understand. And we go, God, why hasn't this happened? And we get worried, we get stressed, and we overreact. And instead of trusting God, instead of going to God and giving it to him, we stress out and we worry. And we take it all upon ourselves. And Jesus, he looked at his, his earthly mother and father and said, why were you looking for me? Why didn't you understand? You should, I've been with you for 12 years. You should know by now that I was going to be about my father's business. I was going to be at my father's house. Uh, on the road to Emmaus, they said this to Jesus. You know, it's been three days. We, we, we thought he was going to redeem Israel. And Jesus tells him, well, why don't you understand yet? Why don't you have faith? Why don't you trust me? You think Jesus ever says that to us? Why don't you trust me? Haven't I proved myself to you over and over and over again? But we get tunnel vision. And we try to handle it ourselves. And we try to work it all out ourselves instead of trusting God. But we aren't as smart as we think we are. I read in, in a paper a while back about a robber who decided he was going to rob a, 
a convenience store. And his plan was he had a $10 bill. He was going to ask for change of the $10. And when the cash drawer opened, he pulled out his gun and took all the money out of the cash drawer. And then left that $10 because he was in such a hurry and took off. When he got home, he found out that he had stolen $4.34 and left that $10 bill there. So in all, he lost $5.66 in the venture and was now wanted for armed robbery. How often do we get ahead of God and think we're going to solve it ourselves only to find out we aren't as smart as we think we are? Jesus always has a plan. And Jesus will always follow through on his promises. We need to remind ourselves, stop having tunnel vision and trust God who sees the big picture. Anyway, that's one thing that popped out at me while I was reading it, but really what I wanted to look at today was how Jesus lived and, and talked and what his focus was on. First of all, notice that they found Jesus in the temple. They found him in God's house about his father's business. We have a verse out in the foyer. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. David said in Psalm 122.1, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I was excited. I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Let us go and worship. There's such excitement there to be with others worshiping God, rejoicing in God. Where would you typically find a 12-year-old? Playing baseball? Playing, baseball? Playing, video Playing video games? Skateboarding. Skateboarding? You can see the skateboard park, kitty corner over there. Uh, recording TikTok videos? <laughs> Out in the farm working? So they... they they might have tried all sorts of things like that, searching for Jesus, but they found him at the temple. Because, it, you know, it didn't occur to them that's where a 12-year-old would be. How about a 21-year-old? Where would you find a 21-year-old? In the temple? In the bar? Some at college? Some working? Some married? Some up with a child? Probably not in the temple. We get all these things trying to capture our attention, and we forget to keep the most important things in our lives first. The church might not be open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but we can be having church. We can be worshiping God. But are we? Do we spend so much time watching TV or doing other things that we don't have time for God? Jesus was faithful to be about his father's business. Are we drawn here to worship? Are we excited on Sunday mornings? Saying, oh, I get to go to church. I get to worship God. I get to study the Bible. I get to gaze upon Jesus. Uh, Eileen shared something this week on Facebook that stuck with me. Why do we close our eyes when we pray? Because the best things in life can't be seen. They need to be felt with the heart. It is such an honor to come together to worship God, to sense him, to feel him. To enter into his presence to come into his courts, to exalt him. But you know there's more to church than just coming and worshiping God? I like what it says in Hebrews 10 about it. In Hebrews 10, 19, 
The author of Hebrews says, Brothers and sisters, we have confidence that we can enter the Holy of Holies by means of Jesus' blood through a new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, which is his body. And we have a great high priest over God's house. It's not the preacher. It's Jesus. Therefore, let's draw near with a genuine heart with the certainty that our faith gives us, since our hearts are sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies are washed with pure water. Let's hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, because the one who made the promise is reliable. It goes with what I mentioned a little while ago. And let us consider each other for the purpose of sparking love and good deeds. Don't stop meeting together with other believers, which some people have gotten into the habit of doing. Instead, encourage each other, especially as you see the day drawing near. As the day draws near, it's more and more important for us to gather with our brothers and sisters to worship God. But I love something he says there in verse 24. Let us consider each other for the purpose of sparking love and good deeds. A chief purpose of the church is to encourage each other and to spark love and good deeds. You know, um, a lot of people say, well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Well, you need a fellowship of Christian brothers and sisters to be the church. Because unless you are encouraging others, unless you are sparking love and good deeds in others, you aren't being Jesus. Jesus had a, a band, a, a fellowship with him. And he invested in their lives and he ministered to them. He started the church and, and the chief purpose of the church, of his group, wasn't just to worship God, but to help each other grow, to encourage each other, to learn from Jesus. Now, that's hard for people to understand nowadays because we have such a consumer-oriented society where it's fast food and everything's about me, the customer is always right. And people go from church to church or, or just show up expecting the pastor to feed me. They don't care about investing in each other. They don't care about ministering to others. It's all about the church ministering to me. We've been called by God to ministry. And every Christian believer has a ministry. Not all Christians are called to be pastors or missionaries or evangelists or Sunday school teachers. But every Christian has a ministry. All of us have been called by God to be Christ-like to a dead and dying world. No excuses. Moses tried some excuses and how'd that work out for him? Are we gathering to encourage each other to spark love and good deeds? Do we bring others in with our excitement, with our love, with our joy? There's an old joke back when I was a kid. I remember hearing that Somebody died in a church. They were sitting in the pew and they passed away. And so they called uh, an ambulance to come and take them away. And the, the paramedics came and they had to check 10 people before they found the right person. <laughs> do we have the joy of the Lord? Do we have the excitement? Do we have the fire of God so that people know we're alive? So that people will come and say, wow, there's something real there. There's something genuine. The power of God is there and the love is there. And I feel like I experienced God after I leave. Do we have that? Next thing I'd like us to notice is that Jesus was all about the Father's mission. And so the question for us is, are we? Jesus told us to seek first the kingdom of God. Not seek second, not seek third, not put other things above, but to seek first, to put first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. 
In 1 Corinthians 6, it says that you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and spirit. You've been bought with a price by the blood of Jesus, and there's nothing more precious than the blood of Jesus, and that's what was paid for you. You've been bought with a price, therefore be on mission, be on point. Jesus said, let your light shine before others. He said that you are the salt of the earth. He said, take up your cross and follow me. When God comes for us, what will he find us doing? If God came for you on Monday, what would he find you doing? God's business or your business? I want to be found being about my father's business. I might be at a job or somewhere else, but I want God to be foremost in all things. So the big idea for today is that the real Jesus was consumed with his mission. He was consumed with being in the father's house, being about the father's business. Are we? We can be so focused on making a name for ourselves or doing things for ourselves that we lose focus. Sometimes preachers or churches are so focused on making a name for themselves that they, they belittle the name of Jesus. I read a story about Dr. J.H. Jowett, I think it's pronounced. He was an influential, influential British Protestant preacher from the late 1800s, early 1900s. He was a very well-known speaker. He was known and in his time as one of the best public speakers, best preachers around. So he was well-known, and he, he wrote once, he said, I went out early one morning to conduct a camp meeting ways away off in the woods to two or three hundred men from the Water Street Mission. At the beginning of the service, this prayer was offered over me. O oh Lord, we thank you for our brother. Now blot him out. Then the prayer continued. Reveal thy glory to us in such a blazing splendor that he shall be forgotten. Too often we get consumed with our own things. Could we pray to God, God, blot me out. So that your splendor, so that your holiness, so that Christ's likeness will consume me. So that others will see Jesus in me. They'll see me and know that they are doing God's work. They are living for God. You know, we shouldn't have to wear a Christian t-shirt or have a Christian bumper sticker for people to know we're Christians. It should be in the what we say, the way we act, the way we treat people. If Jesus were to come for us this week, would he find us doing our Father's business? Would we be doing our Father's mission? Father, I pray that you'll speak to each one of us, that you'll help us to go out these doors and to take seriously the calling that you've placed upon each one of us. Every single one of us has a mission. We all have a ministry that we could be doing for you. And none is more important than the other. A preacher is not more important than the janitor. We are all servants of the kingdom of heaven. And we all need to put you first and seek first your kingdom and your righteousness above all things. Help us not to love money and love you because we'll end up loving money more than you. Help us not to love power and love you because we'll end up loving power more than you. Help us not be addicted to things, God, possessions, shows, anything, God, that could replace our love for you. Keep our hearts so tender to you that the Holy Spirit, his, his voice will speak and we'll be able to hear it because we're not so clouded up in our minds with other things, but instead we're focused on you. Help us not to be content with a casual, lukewarm Christianity, but to seek you first in all things. In the name of Jesus. Amen.